Welcome to When Gen X Ruled the Multiplex, the films that shaped the MTV generation. Today's film, from 1982, capitalized on the emerging Gen X love of video games and was a huge leap forward for the world of visual effects. Disney's Tron was directed by Steven Lisberger, with a screenplay by Lisberger from a story credited to Lisberger and Bonnie McBird. We open in a video arcade, where someone plays a game called The Light Cycle, in which two streamlined motorcycles race against each other in a sleek digital arena. We then enter the computer system of the corporation that owns the game, the tech conglomerate Encom, where a villainous computer program named Sark consults with the unseen, all-powerful, and totally evil Master Control. Sark is played by English actor David Warner, who also provides the voice of Master Control. Master Control, which began life as a humble chess program but now dreams of world domination, has been capturing smaller programs within the ENCOM system to force them to fight to the death in games like Light Cycle. We meet two such programs, a nebbish compound interest program named Crom and an actuarial program named RAM. Crom is played by Peter Jurassic, while RAM is played by Dan Shore, whom we have already seen playing Billy the Kid in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Meanwhile, in the real world, we meet the owner of the video arcade, a brilliant programmer named Kevin Flynn. Flynn is played by Jeff Bridges, beloved star of The Big Lebowski and many other films, and who, at the time of Tron, was already a two-time Oscar nominee for The Last Picture Show and Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. He's gone on to rack up four more Oscar nominations, plus one win. Flynn has written a program named Clue, which he has illicitly inserted into NCOM system to find and steal some data. As personified in the digital realm, Clue is also played by Jeff Bridges. Clue is promptly discovered and ambushed by recognizers, flying attack vehicles that work for Sark. Master Control interrogates Clue for the identity of his user, i.e. the person in the outside world who is actually using the program. Clue refuses to tell Master Control about Flynn and is destroyed. Back in the real world, NCOM's senior executive vice president Ed Dillinger, who is Sark's user and who is also played by David Warner, consults with Master Control. Master Control and Dillinger suspect Flynn, who is a disgruntled former NCOM employee, has been snooping around in their files. Dillinger shuts down all access to vital parts of the system. The shutdown interferes with the duties of a top programmer named Alan Bradley, who is working after hours in his cubicle trying to run a security program named Tron. Alan is played by popular television actor Bruce Boxleitner, best known in the 80s for starring in the CBS spy drama Scarecrow and Mrs. King, which, fun fact, was my mother's favorite TV show, and she would never let my sister and me watch it because that was the one hour of the week that she insisted on having to herself with no kids around. To this day, I do not think I've seen a full episode of Scarecrow and Mrs. King. The character of Alan is based on noted computer scientist Alan Kay, who would marry one of this film's screenwriters, Bonnie McBird, in 1983. Upon finding he's been locked out of the system, Alan storms off to talk to Dillinger, stopping briefly to chat with a co-worker. We never get a close glimpse, but this co-worker is also played by Dan Shore, and thus is almost certainly the user of the actuarial program RAM. Dillinger tells Alan there's been a dangerous security breach, and thus access to the system has been restricted. In the course of their conversation, Alan mentions that he designed Tron to shut down any unauthorized action by any other program up to an including master control. Dillinger is quietly alarmed by this. Frustrated at being shut out, Alan takes the elevator down to the floor marked Laser Bay 2, because ENCOM is the kind of corporation that requires two floors devoted to laser bays. Two of his co-workers, Laura and Dr. Gibbs, are conducting iconoclastic experiments in transferring solid matter into a digital format via the use of lasers. Dr. Gibbs is played by Barnard Hughes, whom we have seen in The Lost Boys. Laura, who is played by Caddyshack Cindy Morgan, is Alan's current lover as as well as Flynn's ex-lover. Correctly assuming Flynn is behind the security breach, Alan and Laura head to the arcade to warn Flynn that Dillinger is trying to trap him. In the arcade, Journey's only solutions blast, while Flynn wows onlookers by reaching new top levels in a game called Space Paranoids, a feat that will become less impressive in just a few minutes when we learn that Flynn is the designer of Space Paranoids. Flynn confesses to Alan and Laura that he did indeed break into Encom's system because Dillinger stole all his original game designs, including Space Paranoids and Light Cycle and pass them off as his own creations. Alan offers to use his Tron program to shut down Master Control long enough for Alan to retrieve evidence from the system proving Dillinger stole his work. So Alan, Laura, and Flynn break into ENCOM after hours. Alan heads to his cubicle, ready to use Tron as soon as Flynn restores his access to the system. While using Laura's computer in the laser bay, 
away. Flynn is recognized by Master Control, who activates the laser. The laser digitizes Flynn and stores him as data inside the system. A now digital Flynn is taken to Sark's game grid, where he's forced to compete to the death against Kron in a version of Hyalai played on rings suspended above Oblivion. Flynn, who designed all these damn games, wins easily. He refuses to kill Krom, whereupon Sark murders Krom anyway. Flynn meets Ram and another prisoner, an especially skilled player named Tron, who of course is Alan's security program and who is also played by Bruce Boxleitner. Flynn, Tron, and Ram are called upon to compete in the light cycle game. They race cycles around a fast-changing digital maze while they're pursued by foes who try to make them crash. They break out of the boundaries of the game and escape into the greater system. They're pursued by tanks while Sark watches from his command carrier, which sails around the digital world. Check out the cool little Pac-Man game hidden in the fringes of Sark's digital display. Flynn, Tron, and Ram head for a far-off input-output tower, knowing it's the only way to communicate with the outside world. First, though, they splash around in a direct source of pure liquid power, which gets them kind of stoned. Tanks attack again and chase them around, and Flynn and Ram crash their light cycles. Believing they've been killed, Tron takes off by himself to reach the input-output tower and try to contact his user, Alan. Flynn and a badly injured Ram hide from Sark's forces. Upon discovering Flynn is a user and not a fellow program, Ram urges him to help Tron bring freedom to the digital realm and then dies from his injuries. Flynn discovers that, as a user, he can make magical changes to the system. He uses his godlike powers to rebuild one of the recognizers and heads off to find Tron. Tron, meanwhile, meets up with his lover, an input-output program named Yori, who is the spitting image of Laura and who is also played by Cindy Morgan. En route to the input-output tower, Tron and Yori encounter some invalid and slightly sinister programs, identified only as inoperative data pushers. On their heels, Flynn encounters some inoperative data pushers as well, and unless I miss my guess, it looks very much like the Tron universe has digital hookers. Because Tron is made by Disney, this is the closest we will come to sex in this film, unless you count the moment where Jeff Bridges whips off his shirt for absolutely no reason while chatting with Laura and Alan. At the tower, Tron and Yori meet its guardian, a program named Dumont, who looks just like Dr. Gibbs, who was the original founder of ENCOM. Dumont disobeys Master Control's orders and lets Tron enter the tower to communicate with Alan. In the tower, Tron uses an information disk he keeps stored on his back and which maintains records of his every movement in the digital realm, to brief Alan on the situation. In return, Alan sends him the means to erase Master Control. As Tron and Yori head off to Master Control, Sark has Dumont arrested and tortured for helping the fugitives. Yori and Tron board a solar sailor, a winged digital ship that glides along an energy beam directly to Master Control. Flynn rejoins them on the ship, where they're pursued by Sark's flying command carrier and attacked by various menaces. Sark overtakes and destroys the solar sailor. Flynn and Yori are captured and imprisoned with Dumont, while Tron is missing and presumed dead. Sark announces his plan to take Dumont and other captive programs to Master Control to be absorbed into the system. He's going to dissolve his command ship while Flynn and Yori are on board to destroy them. As the ship starts to dissolve, Yori begins to de-res, i.e. dissolve into pixels, which is the film's lingo for dying, but Flynn uses his godlike powers to save her. Tron is very much alive, of course. He makes his way to Master Control, where he whips out his disc, which not only stores information, but is also a kick-ass weapon, and battles Sark. Tron, who is not playing around, smashes open Sark's head with his disc, and Sark's glittery gem-like brains come spilling out. Master Control, which is physically represented by a gigantic glowing head, temporarily transfers all its powers to Sark so he can continue the battle. Flynn and Yori share a heartfelt farewell kiss before Flynn jumps inside Master Control. Tron hurls his disc into the heart of Master Control and erases it. The captive programs, including Dumont, are all freed. The digital realm is restored to a vibrant free paradise, with multiple input-output towers allowing unfettered access to the outside world. Yori and Tron embrace, while back in the real world, Flynn digitally rematerializes at Laura's desk, as her printer spews out evidence proving Dillinger stole space paranoids from Flynn. In his office, Dillinger receives that same message on his computer screen and realizes his career is over. Sometime later, Alan and Laura wait at a helipad for the arrival of ENCOM's new senior executive vice president, who turns out to be Flynn. While not a bomb, Tron was considered a box office disappointment. Nonetheless, it's been highly influential. 28 years after its release came a sequel, 2010's Tron Legacy, in which Jeff Bridges and Bruce Boxleitner returned as Flynn and Alan, and which is memorable mostly for some snazzy visual effects and a totally kick-ass Daft Punk score. There was also a 2012 animated series, Tron Uprising, which takes place between Tron and Tron Legacy. I was very, very late to jump on the Tron bandwagon, as in I just got on board last week. I saw Tron when it came out in 1982 when I was eight, 
and my hazy memories of it are just of everything being very blue. Nothing else about it really stuck in my brain, but watching it now, almost 40 years later, I wholeheartedly love it. The story is pretty cool, and the characters are very engaging, but what everyone's going to remember about it are those visuals. Tron creates a digital universe that manages to seem like a unique and fully realized world. Tron's digital universe was created via a mixture of black and white live action footage that was then painstakingly backlit frame by frame with intensely colored light to make characters and objects appear to glow, intercut with scenes that were entirely computer generated. There's only about 20 minutes of CGI in the entire film, and this technology was still very much in its infancy, so there was no ability to layer the CGI with the live action footage. Nonetheless, Tron represented a quantum leap forward in the field of computer generated visual effects used in films. Tron was nominated for two Academy Awards, Best Sound and Best Costume Design. More significant, though, is what it didn't get nominated for best visual effects. With a minimum of hyperbole, I can state that Tron reshaped the VFX landscape, but in 1982 the field of CGI was still so young that the Academy really didn't know how it should regard visual effects created by computer. Effects technology has moved on considerably in the past 40 years, but Tron is still striking thanks to its cohesive and original visual style. The sets and costumes and some other elements, such as the Solar Sailor, were designed by famed French sci-fi and fantasy concept artist Mobius, while most of the vehicles in Tron were designed by famed neo-futurist concept artist Sid Mead. That's a high-powered duo to have working on your film, and it explains why some moments in Tron are visually startling and really quite beautiful. Tron also features some pretty solid themes about our symbiotic relationship with technology. In the world of Tron, the programs view the users in the outside world as gods who may or may not even exist, and we see that the digital world is a microcosm of the outside world. Every program in the digital world is essentially a digital tulpa of a real-world character. Even as the programs in the digital world have their freedoms restricted by master control, the employees of ENCOM have their freedoms restricted by the power-mad and corrupt Dillinger. The real world even shares a visual style with the digital world. The maze of cubicles where Alan works looks a lot like the cells where the programs are kept before performing in games for Sark's amusement. Dillinger's helicopter is similar to Sark's command ship. The ENCOM skyscraper looks like it could exist in the digital realm. Even as the captive programs are trapped in the system and denied access to the outside world, the film suggests our jobs might be trapping us as well. That's a pretty deep thought to come out of a Disney Disney film that seems like it was designed to get all of us Gen Xers revved up to put our quarters into the Tron tie-in arcade game, which, rumor has it, ended up being a bigger moneymaker than the film itself. Next time we're going to hang with the kids from the High School of Performing Arts when I look at 1980s fame. Thank you for joining me today, I will see you then.